Good morning, my brothers and sisters here at uh, the Upper Room Service. And I also, <laughs> I also bring greetings to our brothers and sisters who are joining us via live stream uh, in the sanctuary. Uh, come, let us pray. Lord Jesus, we gather today to honour you, to worship you, to express our love for you. And we ask, O oh God, that you speak and help us to hear your voice today. In Jesus' name, amen. Not much is known about Malachi. It's a Hebrew name that means my messenger or angel. And it only shows up here in the Bible, nowhere else. Malachi is placed last in a series of prophetic books called the Minor Prophets. And it's the last book of the Old Testament. And so if you've got a hard copy with you, so much the better. If you flip to the last portion of the Old Testament, you'll find this little book called Malachi. Remember Pastor Gilbert highlighted last week that these 12 minor prophets are called minor not because they are insignificant, but because their books are quite simply small or short. What we do know, and you will see, uh, actually, there are major prophets quite long-winded. You see Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel. This is Pastor Gilbert's slide, that, just to remind you uh, from last week. And then you'll see all the 12 minor prophets, maybe one chapter, two, three. Um, and, and, you know, that will give you an idea as to um, uh, the length of, of these minor prophets, the books. Anyway, what we do know is that um, Malachi is one of three post-exilic prophets, and you'll see this right at the bottom of the slide. Haggai and Zechariah are the other two. Now, from its contents, we can deduce that Malachi is one, you know, that was probably written about 430 odd years before Christ. And from this slide, you know, if you take a picture of it, you will notice that this happened after some of the exiled Jews had returned to Jerusalem after decades in captivity. The temple at this point would already have been rebuilt, the sacrificial system re-established, and Jerusalem would have settled down to some kind of normality. But guess what? Once again, the Israelites became lethargic. They became lax and apathetic about spiritual matters. Old habits die hard, don't they? So God's people seem to be stuck in this vicious circle of sinning, and then God warning them, and then they got punished, then they would repent, and then they would disregard and disobey God all over again. And I'm thinking that maybe this is a tendency that we humans have, the tendency to forget. Over and over again, God had spoken to them through the prophets, warned them about painful consequences to their disobedience, and in fact, Moses had prophesied early on. He said, if you, God's covenant people, disobey him, your nation, which is the head of all nations, would become the tail. And just as Moses foretold, they were taken into captivity by Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. And you can read this in, in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 28. And Nebuchadnezzar destroyed the city of Jerusalem and the temple and took many Jews hostage. And this was roughly around 600 years before Christ. And just as Jeremiah prophesied, 
They were held captive there for 70 years. And just as Isaiah had foretold, King Cyrus of Persia finally allowed them to return to Jerusalem to rebuild their city and temple. And just as God had promised, the second temple was completed by Zerubbabel. Then just as the prophet Daniel had foretold, King Artaxerxes of Persia allowed Nehemiah to return to Jerusalem to rebuild its city walls. Amazing, isn't it? Amazing. Time and time again, we see God speaking to his children through the prophets. He would often begin with telling them first, I love you, but here's where you're going wrong. And then he would rebuke them because he would warn them there are painful consequences to sin and unholiness. But God will always end with promises of hope and restoration for the faithful. And the Israelites saw him always standing by his word. God always does what he says he will do. So I ask you, how could it be possible then that upon returning home after 70 years, you know, in captivity, some of us are not even 70 years old yet, the remnant of Israel imagined that they could live and worship once again any old way that they wanted. You know what I mean? They disobeyed God, they suffered 70 years in exile as a result, and now, you know, after he had saved them, and things had settled down, and they were a bit more comfortable, they'd gone back to their old ways. Once again, we see them breaking covenant with God. And I like how the New International Version of the Bible subtitles the text of Malachi. It actually makes very clear the breaking of covenant laws. So how did they break covenant? They presented blemished sacrifices to him. It was kind of like things that actually we don't want anymore or spare change, you know? And we just give to the Lord. They broke covenant by marrying women who worshipped false gods. Why is that dangerous? I don't know whether, you know, guys, you would agree or not. Happy wife, what did Pastor Joshua say once? Happy wife, happy life, right? Yeah, Pastor Joshua is here. Quite often, the danger of intermarrying with someone who worships false gods is the danger is we can also be then influenced by them. How else did they break covenant with God? They broke covenant by being adulterous and unfaithful to their vows that they made to their spouses. And so divorce was on the uptick. How else did they break covenant with God? There was an injustice. They practiced unjust uh, ways to one another. They practiced occultic they did a cultic practice. There was adultery. They told the lies, even white lies, even bearing false witness in court. They cheated the laborers of their wages. They oppressed the defenseless, the widows, the orphans. They broke covenant with God by withholding his tithe. They had completely forgotten that they were his chosen people, supposed to be a model of godliness in society. And there's a biblical saying for it, a dog returning to its own vomit, Proverbs 26. And I wonder whether you are aware of the phrase that comes after that, as a dog returns to its vomit, so fools repeat 
it's their folly. The Hokkien term is ntai si lah. Someone who just doesn't get it, who doesn't grasp the impact of their actions. I don't know. Maybe they'd grown tired of waiting. They were so sien already. And maybe they were asking themselves, was God ever going to fulfill the prophecies that promised a Messiah who would reign over the earth? Was he ever going to come? Maybe they thought God had abandoned them. Huh? didn't really love them, just as he didn't love Esau. I mean, Malachi starts with that. Maybe they thought he wouldn't keep his covenant promises to them. Or maybe they just became complacent and didn't fear God anymore. But here, they had gone so far as to even question God's sense of justice and his rule over the world. They were asking, where is the God of justice? How come God was allowing heathen evil nations like Babylon and Persia who had done such horrible things to them remain unpunished? And God responds, you ask me where the God of justice is? Well, the Lord whom you are seeking will come and he will come suddenly to his temple. I will come to judge you. I will come to put you on trial. I will come to testify against all that you have been doing. But first, I'm going to send my messenger who will prepare the way before me. Just who is this messenger whom the Lord would send to prepare the way for his sudden arrival? Well, the verse that uh, Uncle Edward just read to us, Malachi 3 verse 1, is quoted three times in the New Testament, all identifying John the Baptist as being that messenger. Jesus himself refers to John as being more than just a prophet. To Jesus, John was the one who fulfilled Malachi's prophecy in chapter 3, verse 1. This is he, Jesus said, of whom it is written, Behold, I will send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. That's in Luke chapter 7. And Matthew as well records it. You will notice though, that although Jesus cites Malachi, the words he uses differ slightly from the actual Malachi verse. So you'll see it up on the slide. You'll see that in Malachi 3 verse 1, it reads, the Lord of hosts says, Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. First person pronoun. When Jesus quotes this verse, as recorded in Luke and Matthew, he says, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. So some scholars uh, talk about this as being a reflection of that absolute unity of the first two persons of the Trinity, Father and Son. How they identify so interchangeably uh, with each other. So you know in Malachi, um, it's God the Father who's talking and he's using me like the royal we like that. So like, for example, if Pastor Gilbert says something up here, or Pastor Joshua says something up here, or Pastor Ben and Pastor Kaiming over in the sanctuary, and they make a statement of some sort, you can all believe, because we work very closely together, that Wendy also agrees. So it's almost like a royal we. Before me, the Lord of hosts is saying, including also identifying with Jesus. 
Other scholars think that actually Jesus, in quoting Malachi 3 verse 1, was addressing the people. So he was saying to them, Behold, I sent my messenger before your face who prepare your way before you. You with me? So he's also addressing and saying that this is the case for the people he was addressing. I like the interchangeable unity bit. Now the Gospel of Mark doesn't cite Malachi in testifying to John the Baptist, but Mark quotes a parallel passage from Isaiah. You will read it in Mark chapter 1 who also prophesied about the messenger to come. And Mark also identifies John the Baptist as that messenger. So John is the one called my messenger by God. The Lord who then follows after that, the one the Israelites are seeking, is Jesus Christ, the Son of God. So John the Baptist is the forerunner of Christ, but he too became unsure when he was in prison. Because like the rest of the Israelites, his expectation of the Messiah to come was also one of a conquering, very stern king. So that's why he sent his disciples to ask Jesus, are you the one who is to come or should I look for another? This is the same John, you know, who acknowledged Jesus and said to him on the banks of the Jordan River that he wasn't fit to baptize him. This is the same John who had said that Jesus is the one who comes after me, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. This is the very same John who exclaimed after he finally baptized Jesus, behold, this is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. What happened, huh? John was so sure at the early stages that his cousin was the Messiah. The reality of what Jesus was doing didn't quite match John's expectations. You know, at the end of the day, what's so touching to me anyway is that at the root of it all, God actually just wants a righteous nation of people, a pure and devoted priesthood. He just wants happy homes. Because you know that John the Baptist was also identified as the Elijah who was to come. And if you go to the end of Malachi, you will find that this Elijah is the one who will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers. It's touching, isn't it? That at the root of it all, God wants happy homes. He wants God-fearing children in our happy homes. He wants a people who speak the truth, who have integrity, who do what they promise, they say they will do. God wants a people who are generous to him and to one another. God wants a people who are grateful, grateful for all that we have and acknowledge him as the source of all that we have. God wants a people who are faithful, who love, and who display hope. That's God's heart for us at the end of the day. And his heart for us has not changed. Peter says that you and I are now part of that royal priesthood of God, a chosen people, beloved of God. And I wonder... Would we be able to say right now that this is true of ourselves? 
pure in our hearts, devoted to God, with happy homes, God-fearing children, truthful, honest, reliable, generous, grateful for all that God has blessed us with type of people, faithful to vows that we make, a loving people, which you are as in 830 Sanctuary, I know you have no problem with, and a people full of hope because we live in light of a glorious future that is promised to us by Jesus. And you know, the late Joseph Chen comes to mind. Just nod if you're familiar, just so in, in case I need to explain. Well, I think most of us do. He's ministered here at URS a lot. And Joseph Chen was uh, the former uh, uh, head of uh, YWAM Singapore, Youth with a Mission. And he led Antioch 21. And he died in, uh, suddenly in an accident uh, last week. Those of us who knew and loved him would describe him as being pure in heart, wouldn't you say? Utterly devoted to God. The eulogies we've heard this past week, even from his daughters, testify to the fact that his home was happy, his children God-fearing, that he was a truthful man, standing with integrity, generous-hearted. I mean, Pastor Kaiming was a buddy of his, and Pastor Kaiming had the privilege of preaching at his wake service. Pastor Kaiming can tell you this. And I heard from another colleague whose uh, wife was, is suffering from cancer, that on the day Joseph Chen left for that faith, faithful trip to the Middle East, I don't know how he did it. He brought chicken soup for the wife. If me, a uh, traveling already, uh, I would be urgently packing my bags, you know. Grateful for all that God had blessed him with. Very grateful for the little things that uh, his friends blessed him with. A man faithful to his wife, faithful to his calling, a loving man and always living with hope in Christ. Joseph lived in light of that glorious future promised by Jesus. He also lived it in fear of God because he knows and he knew and so should we that the day of reckoning, the day of the Lord will come. So many of us are still grappling with our lost, asking ourselves also, you know, why a brother like that would go so suddenly and so soon? Joe reminds me of John the Baptist, his passion for missions and people. Would you say that he prepared the way of the Lord, not just in Geylang, but when he ministered here at Barker Road, in Singapore, in many parts of the world? He was, after all, on his way home from teaching in Egypt when he died. You know, I, I had occasional lunches and brunches with Joe. And one of those that I do remember was, you know, in, in my first few months, I shared with him some of my fears and concerns about stepping into the role of PIC, of Barker Road Methodist Church, some more. So three years ago, I remember that particular brunch. I had been hearing God, or I thought I had been hearing God, because I'd been asking God, what do you want for Barker Road? What do you want of me? I'm only a little woman. And God had given me, I believe, some impressions. And one of them was John the Baptist. And it kept coming up. And I had this sense that God was telling me, your role is to prepare the way for me. So I, I shared with uh, Joe, am I hearing God or am I hearing myself? And he laughed at me, ha, 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 over breakfast. And then he said to me, I are very simple. Uh, you do have an anointing on you. You are simply to be the road sweeper. 
So from now on, people of Barker Road, just call me Road Sweeper Wendy. From time to time, the Lord would bring this up to remind me about one of the things that I'm supposed to be doing, to be a road sweeper for him. And is it coincidental that this last fortnight, as I prepared for this message, John the Baptist kept popping up in various ways, whether it came through something that I read, or an app, or a message that someone would send me, talk about God wanting to get my attention. You know, Pastor Gilbert, I'll give you an example. Pastor Gilbert does an amazing job as our equip pastor. And one of his many responsibilities, we work together, right? The pastors work together on the pulpit. One year before, we are planning the pulpit. But Pastor Gilbert is the one who has the final responsibility. He had planned the series and our scripture text for the series. And would you believe that the lot fell to me to preach today and lo and behold, what's it all about? The messenger, John the Baptist. I'm not sure I had shared with Pastor Gilbert about all these impressions about John the Baptist that I had been receiving. He's shaking his head. I don't believe in coincidences anymore. Last Monday, this was after we had received news about Joseph. What I do in the mornings between 5.15 to about 6.30 is my normal routine would be if I wake up. The first half hour, as I go in, I use an app which I subscribe to and it leads me in a lectio on the lectionary text for the day. So I'll reflect on it, there'll be silence, right? And it's a way of praying. Then I would move on to the uh, exegesis of the text uh, where it would open up that particular text for the day. Ever since I started using it, it's always been the same. So if it's Matthew 1 for the Lectio, then the exegesis and the opening up and the reflection on the, the, the text would be on Matthew 1. What are the odds that on Monday, the lectionary text for the Lectio was Luke 19, the talents, the parable on the talents. When I went to the exegesis portion of it, and it's audio, right? What popped up was, do you want to guess? Do you want to guess? John the Baptist. So I thought, how come, huh? By this time, over the last fortnight, I had heard about John the Baptist in various ways at least six times. So I thought, oh God, why on Monday? You know, so I checked and yep, it was written there, the text, Luke chapter 19. But what I was hearing was John the Baptist. So I went back to check. Maybe I went to the wrong day or what? Nope. So I listened to it. My heart by this time was a bit... Pounding, you know. Barker Road family, I believe that there is a message for us today. God wants us to hear loud and clear that first, you and I are part of his chosen covenant people. We are his covenant people chosen to reflect his character and communicate his message of hope to the people we live with, work with, come in contact with. And we are a covenant people who have made vows to him. We've made baptism vows, vows at our baptism when we are received into membership of this church. I regret to say some people want to become members of Barker Road so that they can get their sons into ACS. And I'm saying to all of us, let us take this seriously. Because when we stand before God, we're actually making vows, covenant vows with him. 
When we become married, for those of us who are married, we make marriage vows to be faithful until death do us part, to love and to cherish for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health. These are covenant vows. At the watch night service every year, we renew these covenant vows that we've made with God. And I think there's some forth telling into our situation today. I think that God's calling us to make holiness a top priority with urgency in our lives. We've got to be intentional about it. Christmas is coming. It's not about the panettone that I enjoy. <laughs> It's actually a reminder to us that Jesus has come in person, that he will come again. And as he has promised, he will do it. It will come suddenly. I wonder, maybe some of us are very sien ready, quite tired of waiting for him. Unsure as to whether Jesus, is he really going to fulfill his promise to us? Maybe some of us doubt that Jesus even loves us. Maybe we even are questioning God's sense of justice and his rule over what is a very messy world. His reminder to us today is this, I, the Lord, Malachi 3.6, do not change. All you need to do is to return to me today and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. You and I have a prophetic calling on our lives and I believe for myself personally and Barker wrote that it is a calling to prepare the way of the Lord as individuals as a community our role is to prepare the way for the coming day of the Lord the sense of being of clearing away obstacles in the path the sin that clings so tightly so that the Holy Spirit can flow unhindered. And it has to begin with a commitment to fear God. I was told that Joe's wife Kim spoke at his funeral service and he, she said there was one non-negotiable with Joe. The, the time he spent with the Lord swimming I know this to be a fact because he personally told me this numerous times. You know how I know? Because I asked him, how can I be more like you, Joe? That prophetic gifting you have, that ability to discern and see the truth of God and how he's moving in the lives of people and in churches and for the nation. That, that sense of courage that you have, your boldness to just speak and be confident that it comes from the law. You know what he said to me? Hmm. This is what you need to do. He said, I spend time almost every day, as far as I can, with the Lord for two hours, every afternoon in the water as I swim. Non-negotiable, then I looked at him, he said, Joe, I don't like the water. <gasps> Imagine I'm in the public swimming pool, then Pastor Gilbert and his wife and Pastor Ben and Kaiming and Joshua and their wives walk by, they're going on their way to lunch, then go, hey, Wendy, how are you? I shy. La. <laughs> a wise all of a friend said, oh, yeah, you're so silly, it's not about the water. La. It's about the two hours dedicated to being with the Lord. And I'm going to close with this. I actually wanted to ask the worship team to close with the song that they've chosen. But I'm just going to do this. I'm going to ask you, and at URS we are going to be able to respond later. But I think Pastor Ben will also be leading a time of response in the sanctuary. The call to us today is this. Put God First, make it a non-negotiable. And if you cannot offer him and covenant with him two hours a day, I think God might even be pleased if you give him 15. And in 
the opening service of next year, I will be sharing my vision about how we can take this forward in practical ways in our lives. Let us pray. Oh God, you have called us to prepare the way for you. Help us, oh God, to move forward confidently and be prepared, Lord, to lay down our lives intentionally and in a manner that is non-negotiable, that you might be glorified. In Jesus' name. Amen.